As a rooted deeply and forward-looking community, we hope that you will be blessed by this message. For more information, visit rechurchza.com. Good morning, everyone. So great to be back at Remembrance. We've had a last, last time we were here, I had fun. I don't know about you, but uh, it is amazing to be here this morning. Thank you so much, Annie, Vanessa, for opening, trusting us with your people this morning. We trust that you'll be blessed as you <laughs> risk with us again this morning. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, but I've got quite an introduction this morning, so we'll read, we'll get to Matthew chapter 18. Just bear with me. Last time I was here, I, I spoke out of Matthew chapter 16. I don't know who was here last time when we came to visit. And uh, we spoke about a very particular thing. When you get a revelation of who Jesus is, stuff starts to happen in your life. And we spoke about Peter and how Peter got the revelation, but people, uh, Peter lived with reason and he, and he got rebuked by the Lord. Can you remember anyone that was here that morning? If you can remember that, then I'm really impressed. Because it's, it's a long time ago. This morning I want to continue in Matthew 16. And uh, spe- specifically reading out of Matthew chapter 18. Because what's interesting about Matthew 16, 17, 18, there's only three times that Jesus mentions the word church. It's interesting. And I want us to look at those three instances because there's so much in it for us. But last time we were here, we said if you get the revelation of who Jesus is, amidst the reality of what the world says or does, things will start to shift in your life. Three specific areas. The music, that I can see the Lord has shifted since the last time we were here. I'd love to hear about the businessman, what's happening in your businesses. Is there anyone that from the last time have seen the Lord unlock resource in your business? One, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Awesome. So the word is still faithful. Then I want to find out what's happened to the shepherding in the life of the church since we were last time here. Benny, maybe you can tell us. Has it been more challenging or more easy? More challenging. Awesome. Then I've got the right message for you this morning. You see, friends, when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about getting a revelation of who he is and what he's doing on the earth, there's a clash of kingdoms. I'm blessed this morning to stand in the presence of the Lord because of what your music has produced. I'm blessed to hear the testimony of the Lord unlocking finances through your businesses. This morning, I want to talk to you specifically about the pressures of shaping a culture of honor. That's hard work, Papa. This is where pastoring happens. And so by way of introduction, I just want to say this. The ministry of the Holy Spirit primarily does three things. There's more. So please don't come and correct my theology, but I want to highlight you what the activity of the Spirit does amongst us according to Acts chapter 2. First one, the, the Holy Spirit loved to touch His people. We love as, as preachers, we love to, to preach on the, the touch of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, man, the Lord touched you powerfully. And he's going to touch you again this morning, man. He touched you powerfully this morning in worship, didn't he, man? The Holy Spirit did. He's going to touch you more. Wow. The activity of the Spirit amongst us is to touch us. It says in Acts chapter 2, once the Spirit came down on the early church, a community was formed, which means this activity of the Spirit amongst us loves to pull us together. That's how you know how much of the Spirit was in a meeting, not by way of those who got touched, but whether people want to go home or not. It's interesting to measure that one. The last one, activity of the Spirit, is that He loves to transform our lives. He loves to transform us. And what you see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, is you see four simple things the early church started to do. And I want to encourage you. That's why I'm saying it's a bit of an introduction, but I want to encourage you. Because as a community, you've set yourself on course to be transformed. Acts 2 verse 42, what does it say? Let's read it together. Sorry, keep your finger in Matthew 18. We're going to get back there. But let's just read this together. I want to show you this because this is an encouragement Henny, to you and Vanessa and the team of leaders and to you a people. Because I know what it feels like when 
when the Lord starts moving on some of these things. Can I just say that Linden doesn't need another church. Randburg doesn't need another church. Is he okay, man? Doesn't need another church. He needs a people that is willing to confront the cultures of this world and bring in the culture from heaven. Do you find in Acts chapter 2 is what it looks like when that transformation starts to happen? Look, read it with me in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. What you've just read is the four simple practices that the Holy Spirit uses to transform the culture of the world into the culture of heaven. Can I encourage you, when you start to confront culture, sir, now you're in a war. Now the game is on. The game is on. These practices are so powerful. I want to just encourage you because I know that you're on this course. Let me help the ladies understand this thing. If I were to constantly practice eating less, ladies, what will happen to me? Anyone? Ladies, help me. If I eat less and less and less, if I keep practicing eating less, what will happen to me? Lose weight. It's a good thing. If I keep practicing overeating, what will happen to me? There goes the six pack. What am I saying to you? I'm trying to explain something simple to you. What you practice is linked to a principle, to a law. When it comes to eating, overeating, undereating, there's a certain principle you're practicing. Every time you practice the principle of how energy flows, if you put more in, you store it. If you spend more than what you put in, you use it. There's a practice. It's linked to a principle. It produces something. Mark Aksin Madela. Follow me? These four practices is the four practices that produces the culture of heaven. Let's go slowly. If I undereat, I keep practicing undereating. There's a principle of how energy is spent that produces me to become skinny. Happiness. If I overeat, there's a principle of storing energy I tap into that buffs me up. Happy? When you as a church set yourself to practice these four spiritual principles or four spiritual practices, you are tapping into spiritual principles that's busy producing something. The first principle or the first practice that you started engaging as a community is the apostles' teaching. UPA. That was easy. When you start to practice what the apostles taught through the foundational truths of righteousness, my goodness, you are practicing something that's linked to a principle. Do you know what the principle is called? Spiritual principle? It's the principle of agreement. We're establishing our agreement. We're working out our agreement. Do you know what that agreement produces? Power, presence, and provision, just like it is in heaven. Happy? The second practice that says there is fellowship. Fellowship is the practice I do when two fellows are on a ship together having a nice conversation. For us to have fellowship, I have to prioritize my diary. I have to prefer you with my time. Do you know that? So it means I need to honor you enough, Henny, to say, I'm not going to preach at the base this morning. I really value this couple. I want to come and honor them with my time. I'm going to open my diary, give them time so that we can fellowship. What's the spiritual principle that's busy working? It's the principle of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you will reap. Do you know that? It's amazing how many people sow no fellowship into the body, but when panic strikes, they demand the body 
to be available for them. All that's happening is you're busy reaping what you've sown. Oh, the church is this, the church is that, the church is this, the church is that. But where were you when you could have made a decision around honoring us with your time? That's not like a culture challenge. Isn't it? I want to preach about that one this morning. If you practice the principle of sowing and reaping, what does it produce? Produce a culture of honor. Produce a culture of honor. You know why a culture of honor is powerful? Because God loves to show off where there's honor. He loves to show off. Then the fourth one, third and fourth one, I don't want to get into too much this morning, but there's a fourth, third and fourth practice of breaking bread and prayer. Both of them is linked on the spiritual principle of exchange. I'm teaching now, I'm not preaching. I want to just encourage you as a community because you've set yourself on a course to transform the culture in Linden and Randburg. Not to just have a nice church. It's two different worlds. Markinson? When you break bread, you're practicing the spiritual principle of exchange. Because Jesus took your place on the cross and gave you his position with a crown. Every time you exchange it, every time you practice breaking bread, you're practicing the principle of exchange. It's powerful what that does. And then it says the, the practice of prayer, same principle. You're practicing the principle of exchanging your pressure for the peace of Jesus, Philippians 4. Happy? What happens if you keep practicing the principle of exchange? What culture does it produce? It produces a culture of freedom. Then you're really free. You're free from disease. You're free from pressures. You're free from anxieties. You're free from all sorts of things that the world is trying to press on you. I want to commend remembrance this morning. I want to commend Vanessa and Henny for going on the pursuit of transforming culture. It is far easy just to have nice church Sunday morning. Get a lack of preach, get a lack of band. Man, it felt like something happened. But nothing shifts in the culture. I personally didn't sign up for that. I want to see the culture of heaven come. And transform the West Strand. I want to see the culture of heaven come transform Linden. I want to see the culture of heaven come transform Randburg. I don't know what you signed up for, but that's what I signed up for. Now, what I've discovered is there's certain pressures <laughs> that comes with that goal. I want to talk about them this morning. Let's open to Matthew chapter 18. I want to talk about the pressures of transforming a culture of honor, or forming a culture of honor, shaping a culture of honor. This is a long introduction. But all that is simply just to commend you, Henny, Vanessa, for taking God's people on a journey to transform the culture. It's been painful. There's been pressure. But my goodness, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Matthew 16, Lord, just freedom, 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 freedom. I think that's the longest introduction I've ever done to a preach. But I'm not here to preach. I'm here to help you transform the culture. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here to actually help you confront the culture. That's more accurate. <laughs> I want us to confront the culture of this world, friends. Want us to confront the kingdoms of this world. There's one king. There's one kingdom. His name is Jesus. And every king and kingdom will bow before him. You okay? Wonderful. Let's just read Matthew 16, if you would. Verse 17. Now, just to, to recapture the last time I was here. Matthew 16, 17. Jesus replied... Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That is, that is loaded. 
The church that Jesus is building has the keys to unlock the influence of the kingdom in London. That's what it's saying. Do you know what it looks like, man? It looks like this. You confront the kingdoms of this world and you unlock the reality of the kingdom of heaven. That's something. You bind the kingdoms of this world and you loose the kingdom of God on the earth. So why is it that Lyndon is so messed up still? I'm asking, why is it that Randburg is full of drug laws, prostitution, disease, HIV, if there's a church planted right in the middle of it saying we want to confront the culture? I'm just asking, why is it? Maybe we've not understood what the mission is that Jesus is sending us on. Because Lyndon should look different because of remembrance in its midst. Randburg should look different because of remembrance in its midst. Why? Because remembrance understands they've been given all authority to bind all the demonic and loose all the angelic. Amen? So when Henny and Vanessa put you on this track of settling out your agreement, sorting out your agreement, it's because they've got a bigger picture at play. They want to see the kingdom of God comes to this area. Amen? So if you then look at Matthew 17, you see the glory that should be in the church. I don't want to spend time there. You see the authority that happens or through the church, how the demonic gets dealt with and the story of the healing of a boy with a demon. And then you start to see the manifestations of the sons of God. Oh my goodness, I'd love to preach on that this morning, but there's not time for it. My introduction is long already. Can you think about the possibility that God can raise up sons of God that would find golden coins in the mouth of a fish? Hey, this kingdom thing is radical. Let's not get sidetracked. I want to chase a rabbit now. But Matthew 18. I want to talk to you about the pressures of shaping a culture of honor. Matthew chapter 18. What he's going to deal with is the reason why the church is so authorityless. The reason why the church is not getting it right to bind things on the earth. So let's read together. Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change. If you have a Bible, please underline it. If you don't have a Bible, please repent and bring it next week. Because week. people died for this. It says, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, please underline that in your Bible. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that causes people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter the, the, the life, enter life maimed, or two, sorry, it's easier for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you, the angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Do you know that there's a meeting in heaven about you every day? According to this verse. Verse 12, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep 
And one of them wanders away. Will he not leave the 99 of the hill, on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that one of these little ones should be lost. No me dilafasa. Wem, no me dilaister. What he says next is challenging. Verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it'll be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, they am I with them. Holy Spirit, this morning you are present here already. We welcome you this morning, Holy Spirit. We need you. We need you to touch us. We need you to pull us together. We need you to transform us this morning. And you don't need our permission, Holy Spirit, because you are God. But I want to make sure that we don't live in presumption this morning, assuming you are here. And therefore, I ask, Lord, that you would minister to us this morning. I ask this morning, Lord, that our hearts would start to burn inside of us. That you would come and that you would come and and transform lives, that you would come and touch, that you would come and bring healing, that you would come and bring vision, that you would come and restore. My Lord, I thank you that you've anointed me to serve your people. Thank you that your spirit is on me to serve them this morning. Help me to be sensitive, Lord, to your nuances this morning, sensitive to your voice this morning, so that your people will not just be blessed, but they would be bold. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So what you find in Matthew 18 is you find the pressures for shaping a culture of honor. It says, if you can get it right, if you get the agreement just between two or three, if you can just get that right, God will be present, God will provide, and God will be powerful in what you ask. It was so easy for me and I let to sort out our agreement. It is so easy. It is so easy. It's a bit more challenging to when we had to, to put the third member of the church into the equation to sort out agreement. Because we realized, oh my goeders, there's stuff here. I thought we all love Jesus and we believe the same, only to realize if you start looking at what the apostles taught, ooh, there's actually very little agreement. The pressure you felt saying we're going after this agreement thing. We want to establish what we believe is what we believe is what the Bible is saying. Have you found you're working through the foundational truths that you got to the repentance from dead works? There was a bit of a shift in the church. Anyone? Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Darling Scorpion. Because I realized behind the dead works, the devils are sitting. We had to get rid of the devils. Get rid of the demons. I didn't even have theology for that when we started the journey. And he was far more equipped than what I was. <laughs> it's a powerful thing. You see, friends, when you get this agreement set about what you believe about Jesus and what he's doing with you, nothing will be able to resist you. Nothing will be able to stand against you. So what do you think the enemy would like to do? He would love to put pressure on your process of agreement. He'd love to put pressure on you. And what you find in Matthew 18 is what it looks like to absorb that pressure. When the pressure comes, there's certain things you should know and have set in your heart that makes it possible for you to go and do some things with Jesus. Amen. 
So look at what it says. If we're going to absorb this pressure, if we're going to be able to shape the culture, what's the first place we need to look at? Verse 4 says of Matthew 18, verse 4 says, is therefore humble yourself. Verse 3 says, unless you change. If we're going to go after this culture where God gets honored, after this culture where God will get the benefit of our lives, so we have to get to a place where we will change our posture. We have to change the way we think. We have to change the way we posture ourselves before God. I cannot come to God with pride in mind. I cannot come with an attitude or a posture that says, I know better. He says, unless you change, unless you change your posture to a radical posture towards God as a father, nothing much will change in your life. We have to change our posture. What is the posture that we have to change? Thank you so much for asking. Look at what it says. Whoever humbles himself like this child. What is he saying we need to change? We have to change the posture that God is not angry. God is now my father and I can depend on him for everything. Are you there? Are you in that posture where you're saying, God, you're not angry with me anymore. You've become my father. I am one of your children now. I'm depending on you for everything. Are you there? I tell you what, my kids are there. My boy and my girl. My boy is so there, he does not ask permission to open the fridge. Is your boy there? Does he ask permission to eat something? Almost, almost never. As a matter of fact, if there's nothing in the fridge, he's asking, why is there something to eat? What is your posture like? Dad, I know, you, I know the Bible says you're my father, but, but I don't know. You know can, can, I maybe, can I maybe? Can I get something to eat, Father? If your natural boy does not do that, what about you and your heavenly father? When are you going to step out, sir, and trust that he's backing you, that when you step out, he'll be there to, to follow you up and to back you up? When you present your needs to know he's going to give it to you. We don't treat our kids that way. How much more our heavenly father? Can you see that we need some posture adjustments? We need to start to change the way we think about God. We don't expect our kids to pay for the fridge. We just feel the pressure of producing for them that they can open the fridge and have something to eat. Am I right? Do you think about God as your father in that way? Or are you walking around like an orphan child? Or do you come to him and say, Father, I, I thank you that when I open my bank account, you will have provided So nog een ding wat ek optrap vir oogend. Sorry, Eddie. <laughs> if I apply and take my job for an opportunity, I trust that you will be there, Father. You are looking. You know what I need. Thank you that I can go and put my hand to it, trusting my Father will provide. My Father will do things on my behalf that I cannot even fathom. Why did Jesus come, friends? Why did Jesus come? Nou moet jylle my help, nou moet jylle my help. Enige iemand die so, why did Jesus come? It's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, what do you call it? What do you call those questions? It's not a rhetorical question. For salvation, what does that, what salvation mean for you? Saving you from your sins, great answer, isn't it? Anyone else? Why did Jesus come? Is there another answer? To destroy the works of the enemy. Thank you, sir. Life in abundance. Awesome. Freedom. You know that when Jesus stood before Pilate, he says, I've come to testify about truth. What truth? What truth did Jesus come to testify about? 
that you have a God and that God wants to be your father. He loves you so much that he sent me to take the sin that separates us out of the equation and now you can find rest because God became your father in that moment when you said, I need Jesus. Wow. So friends, we need to worship Jesus, but at some point you have to realize your worshiping of Jesus gives you access to God as a father. And if you are going to be good to your kids, what do you think your heavenly father will do? How much more your heavenly father? We have to adjust our posture. We have to learn to humble ourselves like children to say, Father, my broek is bang, my bus is knee. How does it sound? It sounds like this in Afrikaans. How fast my broek, my bus is knee bang knee. I'm shaking, Father. I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to be prideful in this thing. I'm just going to humble myself. I'm going to trust you as my Father that when I step out, you will be there. When I ask, you will give. How are you in that posture? Are you there? Because unless you're there, you will not be able to shape a culture of honor through remembrance into London and Randburg. We have to adjust our posture. We have to humble ourselves from our pride, my friends. Do you know what it is to have pride? It's to have an opinion above God's. That's pride. So when God says, I command you to love others, and you say, mm, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm going to do that. It's going it's to probably hurt me. It's going to be pricey. That's pride. God commanded you to love your brothers, not suggested to you you love your brothers. It's prideful to think, well, it's a suggestion. It doesn't apply to me. Henny, Vanessa, would you please humble yourself and love on us, but we're not going to love back on you. It's pride. Is he happy? Is he happy? It's prideful, friends. We have to adjust our posture of pride to one of dependence, depending on God as a father for everything, especially when people hurt you. In the West Strand, it's changing now, but in the West Strand, if people have got offended at the base, they would go from the base and start a little church under the Kultubumpi, him and his wife. Now there's another church planted in the West Strand. I, I, I trust it's not the same in Randburg. I don't like this church, you know, they're offending me. No, actually, you've just got an opportunity to grow and humble yourself. Is it not easy? Is it lazy boys not lekker? Are you okay, friends? We have to adjust our posture. What is our posture? We are dependent on God, our Father, for everything as we are building this culture of honor. I'm trusting Him to look after my reputation. Question, what does God value more, his word or his, or his name? What's more important for God, his word or his name? His word. Who says name? Anyone? One or two says name. The psalm says this, God exalts his word above his name. What does it mean? It means this, God is not concerned about his reputation. So why are you concerned about yours? Why don't you just give yourself to attend to his word, to do what his word is asking you to do and trust in God to sort out your reputation? Making sense? You know what it feels like if, if you are the one that's right, but your brother sins against you? Do you know what it feels like to have to humble yourself and say, my brother, I want to come to you and I want to ask, is there anything I've done wrong that's affected our friendship? Please, can we restore that? Do you know how much humility that takes, sir? But that's the kingdom. That's the posture we need. I trust, Father, as I go, that you will sort out my reputation. Do you know there's only one son that actually got it right to look after the name of God or to, 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 to look after God's reputation? There's only one son. Do you know that? 
Because you know that, that God gives to his sons and daughters the privilege of looking after his reputation. He will look after his word. He's saying, would my sons and daughters look after my name? There's only one son. You know what his name was? Jesus Christ. But he's longing for other sons and daughters to get to the place where they can also start to look after God's name. Mark Hickson? Amen. We have to humble ourselves to live in love, friends. It's a posture adjustment. Living in love does not come naturally. Young man, can I give you some good advice? Living in love is a decision you make every day. But do you know what happens when you make that decision to depend on God and to live in love, ma'am? The Bible says your words start to have impact. When you start to live in love, your actions don't confuse your identity. You, if you live in love, you do powerful things, but you don't get caught up in the powerful things because you know I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God. If you choose to humble yourself and live in love, your sacrifices accumulate eternal reward. There's a posture adjustment for us even more to make, to humble ourselves, to trust God as our Father. Do you know that you don't have to be right in the church? You don't have to be right. You have to be loving though. You must be loving, but you don't have to be right. It's amazing how quickly honor can be built if we stop trying to be right. Now I've got the truth. Now I've got the truth. So you've got a portion of it. But if you will choose to be loving, my goodness, do you know what culture of honor the Lord will build through remembrance? It's a decision you make. Can I say, not because they're my friends or they're paying me to say this, you have found in this couple people that have chosen to love. They've chosen not to be right. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> They're setting the example for us. Can you think what Jesus will do with a bunch of people will be choosing to be loving, not to be right? Speak into my life, brother. What do you see? Speak into my life, sister. Adjust. What is it that I need to see? I can't see it all by myself. Can you imagine what culture of honor you start to build in remembrance? What humility? Father, I declare of remembrance that their words will have impact in the spirit world. I declare over remembrance that the actions of power that they will release will not affect the identity of who you've called this church to be. I thank you that I can declare over remembrance this morning that every sacrifice they give will account eternal rewards on their behalf. Father, I ask for this revelation to hit our hearts. Would you bring freedom, Lord? Would you bring freedom this morning? Would you bring freedom? There's people that you need to forgive right now. Just humble yourself. Just choose right now to say, Lord, I choose to forgive so and so and so and so. I choose to forget, forgive Pete van der Merwe, Koos van der Merwe, Sunny van der Merwe. The van der Merwe are in it again. Just choose to forgive them right now. Anyone that comes to your mind, just choose to say, Lord, I choose to forgive so and so. I choose to let them go. Awesome. Verse 5 says, if it comes to the pressure of building this culture of honor, there's a pressure on how you respond. There's a pressure on your response. 
There's a pressure on how you respond. Listen to how he puts it. He says this in verse 5. Whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Now, can I just help you real quick? You have to understand the context here. When you welcome a little child, what can a little child benefit you? What can a little child benefit you? Omar? Nothing. Outside of joy, I know. Omar is the wrong person to ask. <laughs> Omar is like, ooh, my kinky. What can a child benefit you? What benefit can you get out of welcoming a child into your life? My goodness, I welcome two in. I got poof dukkah, sleepless nights, and bills to pay. Anyone that's heard a different, please, you'd love to pray for us. When you welcome a child in, you're not getting any benefit. What are you getting? A whole lot of work. The reason the omas are so happy to get the kids is they can pass them back to their parents when there's a poof duke. Am I right? It says, whoever welcomes a little child, whoever will go through the sacrifice, whoever will respond in a loving way to welcome those who can contribute or benefit them personally, nothing. You are welcoming the Lord into your presence. I know. Can you hear this radical response? Can you hear the pressure that's on that response? As the Lord wants you to welcome people from Linden and Randburg that will benefit you nothing. It'll just be nappies, sleepless nights, sacrificial giving, sacrificial praying, giving, 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 giving. Why? Because you know that Jesus is busy doing something with remembrance that you cannot even fathom. That's a radical response. I mean, I love to connect with those guys that can give maybe something back. I like that. I don't know about you. The Lord had to deliver me from that. You know, it's easy to build church that I want to build by just connecting with those that can give something back to me. We're in a place we trust in the Lord for a building. It's easy now to organize a couple of coffees with some of the guys that's got some backs in the church. Why? Because if I'm connecting with those, maybe they can give something back. That's not what we are called to. You're right. We are called to connect with those that can give no benefit to us. That's radical. So listen, we're opening ourselves up, Remembrance Church. All the issues in the community, please come. We can't wait to have you. Must be something wrong or you must lay a hold of a revelation that will transform your life about how Jesus is building his church and how he wants to use you. When we walk with this revelation, friends, we will start to give. We will not look like the world that says it's all about gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. We have to get that mindset out of the church. We have to get a radical response. I am going to give. Never mind my tithe. Your tithe should be, I mean, you should be foolish not to give your money to the church. You should be giving your time. You should be giving your home. You should be giving your energy. You should be giving your land cruiser to take the gospel into Africa. No, I'm not. It depends where you, whether you're living with reason, trying to sort this thing out in your mind, or whether you've got revelation that you have joined the most powerful army that ever existed on the face of the earth, the body of Christ. How radical is your response, sir? How radical is your response? What has the Lord given you that you can say, Lord, use this? I don't have much. I don't think I've got much, but you can have this gladly. 
What do you think the Lord will do? We have to give like Jesus. We have to learn to give like Jesus. How does Jesus give? He gave everything. Yeah, but Janus, what if I give everything and I've got nothing left? Well, then we have to get back to point one, your posture towards your father. You will never outgive your heavenly father. If you have a poverty mindset this morning, a trust, let's pray for you and trust your heavenly father to get that mindset out of your life. So the Lord is asking a radical response from you. What have you got that you can give? Don't tell me. <laughs> Don't tell us. What have you got that you can give? It's a radical response. To give to others that will not benefit you. Wow. Have you got any idea what the Lord is going to do with your life, sir? He will use you powerfully. But we have to change the way we think about these things. It cannot be, what can I get? What can I get? We have to grow up to the point to say, what can I give? It's a radical posture. It's a radical response. You don't want to get radical? Just give forgiveness. You've already practiced it. That's radical, man. Especially when people hurt you. Two weeks ago, or last week, two weeks ago, my boy got mugged in Joburg. Now he's 15 years old. He's growing into a strong young man. Some good friends that caught us and helped our family in that moment. But for him, it was a big moment. He's a physical young man. They pointed a gun at his head and put a knife on his liver. See, this building church and advancing kingdom is most easy. The enemy came for him in his body. You know what my boy had to learn? I have to learn to give. I have to learn to give forgiveness. Otherwise, I become the martyr. I become the one that suffers. I don't know where you're at, friends. I don't know whether you got mugged, whether you got hijacked, whether you've been through trauma like that in our country. Our country desperately needs Jesus. God is wanting to move in our country, and he's waiting for his body to say, I'll give. I'll stop getting. Our country is messy, man. Beginning of the year, they, they took my bucky. Someone thought they needed my bucky more than what I needed it. After an hour, the tracker retrieved it for me. The police phoned me, said to me, listen, sir, we will, you will only be able to collect your, your bucky on Monday. We'll pound it for you, and on Monday you can collect it. When I got to the pound on Monday morning, I didn't recognize my bucky. Because in the police pound, the police thought they needed the parts of my vehicle more obviously than what my bucky needs it. I sat in front of the police officer and he's saying, oh, sorry, this is the way it happens. I said, so you know what? Our country is in a desperate need of Jesus. The ancestors are not going to cut it. The ancestors is not going to liberate our country, but Jesus will. Wednesday after that Friday, I drive in on an accident where a lady's leg got amputated. For three hours, we're standing next to the highway in Dipslut. It's not a great place to stop. Just a little information for free. You're not paying for that this morning. It's not a great place to stop. But a friend of mine felt we had to stop, and we prayed for this lady. Her, her leg was gone just below her calf. For three hours, we waited for an ambulance. Now, I don't know what, whether it was our prayers or the adrenaline that was in that lady's leg, but if she was bleeding, she would have been dead before the ambulance arrived there. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that for us to bring the solution to South Africa, the church needs to learn how to give. Stop criticizing our government. Stop criticizing all the stuff that's wrong. Ask the Lord, what do I have and how do I give? It's a radical response.
Last one. I'm finishing up. I don't know what time we finish, any. But they say, blessed are the short-winded because they'll be invited back. Maybe I'm already over. Have you got, got space for one more? In your heart for me? Now I'm going to mess with you. So thank you for giving me space. I'm going to mess with those this morning that read the Bible literally. The Bible says it, so that's what we must do. Can we just read a couple of these verses? If that is you this morning, let's read these verses. Matthew 18, 7. Woe to the world because of the things that causes people to sin. Such things must come. But woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If you interpret the Bible literally, we've got trouble this morning. Then we, any, we're going to have to reorganize church a little bit. Get a gelatine at every door. And as you come for a confession session, we'll chop something off every Sunday. That takes giving to a whole different level. You okay? What does that mean? Because surely it cannot literally mean I have to chop off the stuff that I'm wrong with. Then Jesus will not have a body. He will just have body parts. What does it mean? What does it mean? It means we have to take radical responsibility for this journey. I mean, that's radical to cut off your hand, to cut off your leg. That's quite a radical move, isn't it? So what does it mean for us in the church today? It means we have to get radical about these things, friends. We have to get radical. The stuff that's preventing our culture of honor, the stuff that's preventing this culture of seeing the Lord honored in our midst, we have to get radical in dealing with those things. We cannot apologize for it. We have to say it like it is. We have to take action and deal with some stuff that's preventing this honor from manifesting in this place. Is that okay? I know that you serve amazing coffee here. I've got a coffee name for you. I want to introduce you to radical coffees. What does it mean? What does it mean? The Lord says, if you take responsibility for a culture of honor, you are one of those that will start having radical coffees with others. That's what it looks like to take responsibility. My brother, you've sinned against me. Can I just talk it through between the two of you? Can we just settle this thing? It's a radical coffee, that. Nowadays, if my elders ask me for a coffee, I'm thinking, is it a radical one or a nice one? Do they want to bless me or do they want to rebuke me? I'm not even sure anymore. He says, whenever your brother causes you to sin, what does a radical response look like? A radical response is not at night when I go to bed and put my head on my pillow to tell a letter about all the guys and all the girls and the stuff that they've done against me. That's called pillow talk. It's not radical. I was love hartach. You know why? Because I'm causing second-hand offense in her heart. A radical coffee means I'm going to take responsibility. My brother has said something against me. I will go and face him and I will go right and sort this thing out. Just between the two of us. I'm not going to include my wife in the conversation. Can you imagine how radical that is? What do we do in the church? Oh, did you hear about Henny? Oh, there's this thing again. Oh, now they want money again. And you think no one notices. You think no one notices, but heaven is watching, thinking, oh, they're compromising that culture of honor. Friends, we have to get radical with this thing. We have to get to the place where we'll stop talking about one another and start talking with one another on the stuff that's causing us trouble. Yeah, let's do it still for Ochant. Either I'm really hitting a nerve
or I'm missing the boat altogether. And I'd like to believe it's the first one. Now, I'm sorry, this is not typical West African preaching. Just bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I'm sorry, my sister. I'm sorry, my brother. But if you can submit yourself to the kingdom, you will be blessed. But it requires a radical response. What can you gain? What can you gain? When you as remembrance start to get radical with this culture of honor, what can you gain? Can you read it with me? Would you read it with me, please? Matthew 18, verse 18. This is what you can gain. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Yay. Whatever you loose on earth <laughs> will be loosed in heaven. What can you gain? You can gain a spiritual authority that when remembrance get together to pray, hell is shaking. What are they going to bind now? What are they going to say next? Oh my goodness, guys, we are snooking. Can we see if we can apply pressure on them? Because they're about to get this thing right. I signed up for that. Does it come with pressure? My goodness, it does. But here's the beauty of pressure. As long as it's outside the boat, it doesn't affect me. But when the pressure gets inside, big trouble. Then you sink the ship. Friends, what have you got to gain? Not just nice meetings, not just... Get, looking for bigger premises, getting more facilities. That's, that's, that's not what we're after. The church is not about the numbers. The church is about the agreement of those numbers. I'll rather go smaller with two or three that says, man, I'm in, I'm in agreement. Let's do this thing because we will shake heaven. Then 5,000 with opinions and opinions and all this stuff in between. Amen? What did you sign up for? Just to be another nice charismatic church in the suburbs? People come in on a Sunday morning and think, oh, wow, that facility was awesome. The chairs are so comfortable. The coffee is so good. I didn't sign up for that. I mean, it's nice if that happens. I don't mind it. But that's not what we signed up for. That's not the church that Jesus is building. Are you all right? Thank you for taking the time to listen and we hope you've been blessed. For more information, visit readchurchza.com.